Today, the supernatural nature of the Bible. Pastor Paul Porter from Van Meter Baptist in the house today live for you. And if I haven't told you lately, thanks for listening to The View from a Pew right here on The Truth, powered by Webcast One Live. Welcome to The View from a Pew, a conversation among Christians who are out to grow their faith by asking the simple questions, the tough questions, and the stuff you really wish your pastor would talk about. Come on now, let's reason together. It's your voice we want to hear. The phone lines are open, so join the conversation. Call 244-0077. That's 244-0077. Now, here's your host, J. Michael McCoy. All right, welcome. Uh, It's a little bit after uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon on this, the live version of The View from a Pew. Uh, We appreciate you being here. We come to you every afternoon at 2 o'clock in hopes to entertain you, excite you, make you go, hmm, and hopefully to laugh. Hopefully to laugh a little bit because life's just too serious without a little bit of laughter. And um, now we do have... We do have our sound effect machine, but we don't have any laughter on our sound effect machine. We have applause and crickets and rim shots and boos, but we need a laugh. We need you. Can you laugh? Uh, No. No. No, That's Paul. Can you laugh? We need a crowd. We need all of us laughing. All right. Let's all laugh at once on three, two, one. (laughs) 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 I feel like David Letterman. All right, so we're here this afternoon, and we're glad to have you here. Ryan producing, Dave Burrier in the house, although you won't see him or hear from him, or maybe he'll come over to the microphone, but his brand new show, uh, what's it called again? I've Been There, which uh, is live here on Webcast One Live on Thursdays, and then broadcast live on Sundays at, or I mean on Saturdays at 10 a.m., 10 a.m., right here on The Truth, 99.3. So looking forward to having his show. All right, so the supernatural nature of the Bible. Uh, that's Paul's topic today, and, and tell me where that comes from. Well, uh, you know, the, the Bible is an amazing, remarkable book. I mean, we really shouldn't have it right now. We shouldn't have it. We shouldn't have it as it is, but it has made it through time to where we are, uh, through challenges, through attempts to destroy it. Um, and unlike any other book, I mean, there's been books that have been lost over the years. Um, there's books that have just been changed, modified over the years, but we can be so certain about, because, you know, some things I could show you, we can be certain about the transmission of the Bible. And, and so we can really trust it and uh, that it is, that it is what God intended for us to have. And we can use it as a primary source for truth. What, what do you say to the people the, the naysayers, the non-believers, the agnetists, the atheists, the agnostics. What do you say to those people that say, oh, it's been interpreted and rewritten and reinterpreted and it's nothing like it was when it was supposed to be? Well, and this is something we could go in depth with quite a bit. But the, one of the things that you can look at is the from the original writings of the Bible or, or any other writing that's out there from, from the moment that somebody put pen to paper or stylus to papyrus um, and to the moment where we have our first copies of it, the earliest copies that we have available today, because we don't have originals of the Bible, the original things that uh, Matthew and Luke wrote, but we also don't have the originals of what uh, Homer wrote or um, Tacitus or uh, Pliny or whatever, some of these old historians. We don't have the originals, but how old are the copies that we have? And it's just, it's just remarkable uh, that the Bible stands alone in this category because with so many of these others, and I can give you specific time frames, but they come, the first, oldest copies that we have come 650 years later, 700, 1300 years, 2000 years later. Um, but the cop, earliest copies of the Bible that we have come within 50 to 150 years after it was originally written. We have that old of copies. Okay. Now, what about the Kodak Sinexus? I the, said that wrong. The Codex Sinaiticus. Yeah, what you said. Yes, um, it's a, a complete um, uh, a complete translation of the Bible, and it's very old. I can't tell you the dates, but uh, it's 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 pretty amazing how complete it is. And it's written on papaya. 
Sheets. Uh, papyrus. Elite. Yeah. Um, not papaya. <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm not sure. I, I'm so, I assume it's on something like that. Yeah. Uh, no, a friend of mine went and saw it. Wow. He went and seen it. No, went and saw it. And uh, he just said it was amazing. It's just this huge book under glass, mm. you know, and mm-hmm. y- it couldn't even be carried by a single, you know, human being. It's so big. Right. But it's the, it's the original, uh, what is it, Bob? Help me. It goes back as far as anyone ever has gone with a copy of all the books together. Is that right? Not you don't sure. Know either. Okay. You know, that, that sounds right. That, that it is, it is one of the oldest complete copies of yeah. the New Testament that we have. Maybe the whole Bible. I think it maybe just the New Testament. Yeah. I, Ted Roberts, a friend of mine, went and saw it in England. So, all right. Um, uh, Jill King says, focus, Mac. I can't. I can't. I've got David Burrier over here just staring at me. Just, you know, like this. Just. Hey, how you doing? Huh? Is it that your show? So is the fact that he's shaking his head no meaning anything to you? It means he thinks I'm doing a horrible job. <laughs> and he's going to come in here at 5 t- tonight and just make me look bad and smoke me. I don't know. Just, but, you know. I'm getting nervous with people watching. This is radio. I don't want to bring us back to, you know, what we were talking about. What we were about, talking about, I know you don't do that. <laughs> Such an on-task person. But, but I was thinking of the Dead Sea Scrolls, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. Has, was the, the entire book of Isaiah was found in the cave. And so that goes back way back. Yeah, and when I, I guess what I was referring to was the New Testament, but, but the Dead Sea Scrolls would have uh, a lot of the Old Testament, and that, I believe, is the oldest documents of the Old Testament that we have. And still coming, I mean, the Old Testament was probably written from about 1500 B.C. until, um, I don't know, what, around 400 uh, B.C., uh, and the Dead Sea Scrolls we see appearing with documents as old as like 250 B.C. So for some things as old as the Old Testament, that is still in a class by itself. So those people that say those kind of things, they just don't know what they're talking about. Uh, that say... Oh, it's just been rewritten and reinterpreted and things have been lost in the... You well, know, and, well, even like I said, the uh, book of Isaiah shows, and yeah. that was way back in B.C., that it really hasn't changed. Well, and, and true because prior the Dead Sea Scrolls were not discovered until what, like the 1950s? Yeah, uh, 40, yeah, was well, something like that. Close to there, yeah, so in that area. And and so we were already using an Old Testament before then, mm-hmm. and so now the Dead Sea Scrolls are discovered. Now we can compare with something even older, and wow, it's it's almost the exact same as what we had for Isaiah before. Yeah, and I I think it's interesting, Mac and. You know, that there were fragments of other books, Old Testament books mm-hmm. in the cave, too, but not the complete book. And Isaiah is a pretty important book. Yeah. You know, because, well, Isaiah 53, it's talking mm-hmm. about Jesus. I mean, it's kind of interesting, you know, yeah. that, that all of that, that the entire book is there, preserved. Now, it wasn't the original writing of the book of Isaiah. No. Or no. do we know whether it was or not? No, it probably was not. Right. Um, but I think there there may have been some original writings in there, not biblical writings, but other writings from the from the, the group that hid them, uh, the Essenes. And uh, so there's a lot that we can learn from history apart from the Bible. Hmm. Yeah, and even now, uh, archaeology, the digs, are still showing that uh, things that people said it's not didn't happen because we have no proof. They're proving that. Yeah. Things in the Bible are correct, mm-hmm. and and we're seeing that today. We're yeah, finding it's so sad that you know ISIS is going through the Holy Land and just destroying so many archives and things that mm-hmm. have been around for thousands mm-hmm. of years. You know what a shame! What a shame! Uh, Pastor Paul Porter in the house, Van Meter Baptist Church services ten thirty on Sunday. So uh, continue. I'm listening. I'm I'm interested. The supernatural nature of the Bible, right? You know, and you asked about you know, do we are there so many different interpretations and translations and don't they all say different things? And the the thing is that we have so many manuscripts that we can go back to the original languages and, and piece them together. And, and so even if you do have a copy that maybe the copyist made a mistake, you can go back and compare that to so many others and use a process that's called textual criticism to discern what probably was accurate. And all of this is available for people to test today. If you say the Bible could not have said this here, well, you can go back and look at the original manuscripts and and decide for yourself and do the translation on your own if you want. That's all available. But when you look at something like, um, I think it was uh, the Annals of Tacitus, which has a history of, of Rome in it, and, uh, and I was just kind of looking up some of my statistics there. But 
not only does that come to us so much later, like 750 years after the original writings, we don't have any documents until 750 years later. So could there have been some transmission errors in that amount of time? Maybe. We don't know. Probably. But even then, we only have about 20 20 copies available to even compare with to see if what we've got is right. I picked up a copy of, of a modern translation of Tacitus at Barnes & Noble and found out that the author there used just one translation or one manuscript to, to copy the entire thing. Um, but with the Bible, we have 25,000 old manuscripts from before the printing press that uh, go back hundreds, thousands of years, thousand of years, um, that we can compare uh, mutually between them and decide and, sh and see that what we have is accurate. Okay, now I, you have to talk to me like I'm a six-year-old. Who's this Tacitus? Um, you know, if we're just talking about uh, the history of, say, the Roman Empire, where do we get that? How do we know what happened in the Roman Empire? Well, we got to go back to what ancient historians were writing about it back then. And so we don't have a whole lot to go on. So you look at, you look at folks that wrote histories like Tacitus, Thucydides, Herodotus, um, and others like that. Josephus. And Josephus, that's a, there's a good one. Julius Caesar um, who wrote also. And, and that's what we have to put together to, that we have to go on. And so these are just historians. And, and when you look at their writings, which, which in, in some ways people look at these as rock solid truth, yeah. this is what happened. Yeah. Um, and yet with them, they're less reliable than the Bible, at least in terms of knowing whether or not we've got the original writings. How about, um, wasn't it uh, Bocephus? No. What, who did you call him? Josephus. Josephus. Wasn't he one that uh, clearly identified who Christ was and, and many of the things he said was comparable to what the well, New Testament Gospels were? He spoke about it historically, the historical Jesus, that Jesus was there and he had many followers and he was crucified. Mm -hmm. okay. Josephus wrote a book that people refer to, and he was a Jew. But he didn't claim Christ's deity. I don't believe he did. Do you believe no, that? No, and there's, no. And there's, there's a few references to Jesus in historical works, and Josephus is one of those works that mentions Jesus. And so those are important because now we have uh, attestation outside of the Bible that Jesus really did exist. Okay. All right. Let's, uh, uh, let's take our first break. And when we come back, tell me the road we're going to go down. What, what ro road are you going to take us down? Um, maybe we'll talk about uh, how, how folks have tried to destroy the Bible over the years. Yeah. Destroy it, destroy its credibility or destroy... Uh, wipe physically. it from the face of the earth. Wow. Yeah, and I had another thought too. Go ahead. As to uh, thinking about the first century church in Acts that really didn't have a Bible. Right. Mm -hmm. Just curious to mm -hmm. talk about that maybe. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. All right, we can do that. Uh, I'm J. Michael McCoy. If I haven't told you lately, thanks for listening. Uh, I love my job, and I couldn't do it without you. As you may or may not know, we are in our new studios. Uh, Ryan, why don't you uh, turn off the green screen for a minute so you can see what it really looks like in here. We are a big 17 by 14 foot room, and this is coming out of, we were in, what were we in, like a 10 by 10, if we were lucky? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so as you can uh, see around, uh, it's very uh, uh, spacious. And uh, it, uh, it has a lot better lighting, and we hope you enjoy it. Up oh, there's David over there in the corner. No, keep going so they can see you. We want them to see Ryan. Yeah, there's Ryan. Okay, Ron's there too. And, of course, uh, David Burrier over there. See? Yeah, see him? He's just judging me. He's just judging, judging. And then if you take the camera uh, closer up, yeah, you can see us close up. And we, we never had this type of room before. And we also will have a, uh, a floor-to-ceiling stand-up. Uh, where we can do some stand-up work with the green screen. So if I wanted to look like I was standing on the beach, it actually would look like I was barefoot in the beach. And so that gives us the capabilities of doing a lot of fun stuff, not only within the programs of Webcast One Live, but also for uh, clients, customers, maybe you. Maybe you want to come in sometime and record a message. Maybe you want to ask your uh, girlfriend or boyfriend to marry you. Maybe you want to bring grandma and grandpa in and, and celebrate their 50th anniversary and, and sit down with them at a table like this and talk to them and say, hey, grandma, tell me about the first day you met. And it would be digitally, uh, uh, digitally mastered. It would be uh, yours forever. Uh, that's what we do here at Webcast One Live is uh, we make videos or webcasts that help change people's lives. So uh, we'll be coming back right after this live here on The View from a Pew on The Truth. 99.3, powered by webcastonelive.com.
From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Credit cards are like grandkids. They love you, sometimes get out of control, and it's fun to get a new one. Who can stop them from piling on? Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of Des Moines. At the end of the day, you can give these grandkids back, but you're stuck paying off bad credit card debt. We can help you put the fun back into using credit cards responsibly. Right, kids? Yeah! If you need help getting credit cards off your back, call Consumer Credit of Des Moines. Hey. Let me let you in on a little secret. You ready? Always try to do business with people, not places. Especially if you seek honest Christian business people. And when it comes to my car, I really need to trust who's working on it. Now, my family is so blessed. A few years ago, we found a family-owned automobile repair shop that operates as a Christian business also. Open, open. Honest, reliable, trustworthy. It's Amco on Hickman Road in front of Kmart. And it's a family-owned Christian operating business. This family treats your car as if it was their car. Everything from oil changes to transmission repair and everything in between. So the next time you feel the need to be at peace with your choice of who you can trust with your car, give Amco on Hickman a chance to serve you. And tell them Max sent you. If you sit in the back view or the front view, it's your voice we want to hear. The phone lines are open, so call 244-0077. Now, here's J. Michael McCoy. Thank you very much. 21 minutes after the hour on this gorgeous day here in central Iowa. We're live on The View from a Pew, powered by webcastonelive.com. I'm J. Michael McCoy. Of course, Bob Bonseret, the cat in the hat, Ryan's producing Dave Burrier is stocking, and uh, Pastor Paul Porter from the Van Meter Baptist Church here. Uh, their services are ten thirty a.m. on Saturday or Sunday, uh, and we're talking today about the supernatural nature of the Bible. And this is something you're teaching at a Bible camp. Well, at uh, it's called Impact University. It's in July. It's a youth camp, and I'm going to be teaching with another guy, eleventh, uh, twelfth graders, and graduates. And we're going to be using a book called Counterculture, and just talking about uh, dealing with social issues of the times. But I began to notice that a lot of people, some people in our churches, are beginning to move away from the Bible as their source of truth. That if it doesn't feel right to them, then yeah. they're going to come up with their own way of thinking about it. Yeah. And so uh, I wanted to start by just talking about how important the Bible is and that they can trust it to, to guide them in all of these issues. And why, um, give me some context, give me some wording that one of these young people might have said to you, which tells you why they, they don't use it as the basis for right and wrong, good and evil. Well, one of the things that, that, that I've heard come up recently is... Uh, when it comes to certain issues today and okay, here's what the Bible says, and then somebody might turn around and say, well, 
you can't believe the Bible on, on moral issues because people used the Bible to support slavery back in, back in the 1800s. And, and, so, uh, and so that then for them is a reason to say that, well, if the Bible just changes over time, if we can interpret it the way that we want, then who's to say that what the traditional position is today, maybe that's going to change in 20 years from now or in the next generation. And, uh, and to that, I say that it's absolutely wrong that, that people use the Bible to support slavery. Now, they may have named the Bible in support of slavery, but it does not support slavery. Uh, nothing like what you s- saw in, in early America, you know, stealing of, of uh, Africans, putting them on a boat against their will, bringing them over here, selling them like property and mistreating them and beating them. There was nothing like that. There's, there, there's no even context for that in the Bible. Right. Um, A lot of people sometimes use the curse on Ham as justification because, you know, Ham was one of the sons of Noah and there was a domestic dispute and uh, Noah blessed Shem and Japheth, but cursed Ham and uh, said that Ham would be the slaves to his brother, the slave to his brothers. And Ham's descendants did uh, settle in Africa. Uh, The problem with that is, I mean, somebody could say, well, see, if if we support slavery, then we're just fulfilling prophecy. The problem is, if you look at it closely, or if you look at it, you don't even have to look closely, there was never a curse on Ham. There was a curse on Canaan, which was one of Ham's sons. And interestingly, he was the only son of Ham that did not settle in Africa. He settled in the land of Canaan, which who, is... Who cursed is, him? Noah did. Noah did, okay. And uh, uh, but, but supposedly the cursing and the blessing of that day probably would have come... Th- from God through Noah, but uh, but but the curse was was on you know the Canaan, which would have been the lands of Israel, Palestine, parts of Syria, Lebanon, and so you know, if you could use the Bible to justify enslaving anybody, it would be maybe some people in the Middle East, but never Africa. No, and so and so and that's not even a misinterpretation. That's just reading it wrong, and yeah. you can't say, well, I feel like the Bible says that God cursed Ham. Well, no, you can't say that. It's not what the word says. Actually, it's said three times in that passage. It's a curse on Canaan, not Ham. Paul Porter is my guest. He's a pastor at Van Meter Baptist Church. 1030 on uh, Sunday mornings is that service we're going through. Uh, Is this going to be a sermon series also? Right. So I I kind of in in getting prepared for Impact University, I'm preaching through some of the messages at my church. And uh, you titled it Supernatural Nature uh, of the Bible. And you noticed that there were some young people, and when we say young, we mean 17, 18, like teenagers, 19, yeah, uh, who are uh, beginning to uh, take the bait, as I call it, from the low information voters, that's what I call them in politics, of the people that just see something on, you know, here or there, read it there, or whatever, and must be true. Mm-hmm. Or they Google and they don't realize that what they Googled is at the top of the list because somebody's paid Mm -hmm. To have that at the top of the list, not that it might be factual. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it's kind of interesting because in these days and times of social media and uh, so many distortions of fact and truth and the ability to airbrush people and do cartoons and just, I mean, we just showed the green screen for heaven's sakes. It seems that the Bible more than ever shows us what the truth is. Yes. That it doesn't stray from what's Mm -hmm. going on. What do you say to a young person or an old person like me, whoever, who says to you, well, you know, maybe, maybe we need to grow with the Bible. You know, maybe we need to, uh, you know, uh, uh, abortion, you know, yeah, that wasn't okay back uh, 200 years ago because they had coat hangers in back rooms. Now we have the proper medicine and the mother's life isn't in danger and we can tell if a child has Down syndrome and da 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 da. What do you, what do you say to somebody like that? Well, I mean, a couple of things. Uh, I think, first of all, the Bible doesn't change because God doesn't change. And, and, and I think that's a good thing, that we can, we can trust in and rely on God as our rock, that he isn't going to change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that's, that's comforting to me. And, you know, and, and we, change, we change with everything. I mean, there's lots of people trying to change the Constitution to let it grow with us. And... And I think that's a dangerous way to go. Um, but when it comes to the Bible, I think it's great to, ha- great to have a source of truth that doesn't change, that, that is going to be the, the same 
Uh, it's going to tell us what's right and wrong 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago, and 1,000 years from now if we're still here. But yet there are churches that are reading the Word and saying that some certain sins are okay. Mm -hmm. And they're calling the sins that are okay as coming under, well, we have to show love to people. And I think there is love probably... Love and tolerance. Well, yeah, and I, and I think that... That that's the umbrella that they come under that say that it's okay, and uh, but you're saying that God's word isn't isn't He doesn't change, right? He's the same yesterday, today, forever, and but it's a matter of how man interprets what he reads the word, mm -hmm. and so and it, and do you believe that's why there are different versions of Bibles? Um, I mean, I realize that there are so many. If you look at Bible Gateway, there's a huge list of all different Bibles that are considered Bibles. Uh, message being probably one of the, I, I'm not going to uh -huh. comment on what it's saying, but it's uh, more modern English, if you want to call mm -hmm. it that, and uh, paraphrasing, and then the, you know, there are paraphrased versions of what, and some of them one person has undertaken and mm -hmm. written. Not yeah. a group of people, not a group of scholars. Yeah, and you know, the thing is, I think all of these translations are really trying to get to the heart of the Bible. Yes, you may get somebody that tries to get in there with a translation to promote their agenda. But again, we can always go back to the original texts, and we can always evaluate whether or not this is a good translation. But the normal person's not going to do that. That's true. I That's, mean, nobody isn't. There were very few people that are Greek or Latin or whatever, you know, Hebrew. And I think, though, the, our more common translations that we have at least are making that attempt to, to be true to the text, to get to the heart of it. Right. In different ways. I mean, there's your word-for-word -word translations are close to that, yeah. and there's the thought-for-thought -thought translations, and some people don't think those are as good, but they still get to the heart of, the, of what was originally written. Let me ask you. I'm just going to interrupt you. Mm -hmm. Go for it. <laughs> what is the Bible? Now, do you have different versions yourself? I, I have a shelf of lots of different versions, yes. Do you have a favorite? I'll tell you what, the one I, I, I say I don't preach from a translation, but I, but I do read from a translation when I preach, and, and I use the English Standard Version. And uh, one of the reasons was because I had used the inter New International Version for a long time, and I did not like its latest uh, update very much, and so I wanted to switch to something else. What was it that you didn't like about their update? Um, I... And I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I'm just curious. Yeah, and you know, I have to, I'd have to go back to some of my reasoning behind that. But um, some of it was the gender inclusivity, and I'm okay with gender inclusivity when the original Greek is is unspecific. Mm -hmm. But but I but from what I was reading, they were going a little farther than that, and um, trying to be politically and correct, including gender inclusivity when it really wasn't there in the original text. And I, I don't think that was necessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, got it. And there's, is there a version that you would not even go near? Um, I, you know, I don't think I found one that I wouldn't go near, but, you know, I wouldn't want to preach from something that's m more of a paraphrase like the message because it's going to be hard to get to, it's going to be hard to do some good critical study of that. Mm -hmm. But something like that, I don't have a problem with anybody using that for their devotional reading and, and just spending time with God because I think they're going to still get most of the truth. Mm-hmm. Well, what about those books, and I'm not going to call them the right thing, but the blended Gospels or the merged merged Gospels? Have you ever heard of that? Um, I, you know, I've heard of harmonies of the Gospels. Um, I don't know if that's what you're talking about, or maybe you might be referring to some of the, what's called like the lost books, like the Gospel no. of Thomas. Th this is like one that. that's advertised on this on this on station. This station. Oh, yeah, okay. but it's it's a man that has he said that that there's not one word that's been eliminated. He ah. just took the the Gospels. And merge them together so it's a continuous read without eliminating You know, I eliminating think it's it. great, a great idea, and I love to see it. And here's why. Some people look at different, uh, you know, there's four Gospels. There are some of the stories that are retold all four times. And some people say, well, there's a contradiction between this version and that version of the story. Well, I don't see any contradictions there at all in any of them. You know, for instance, at the resurrection, one author may mention two angels at the tomb, at the empty tomb. Another author may mention that one of the angels, one angel spoke. 
but doesn't mention the second angel. And so, ah, that's a contradiction because one says one angel, the other says two. Well, I don't see a contradiction there. Um, see that one author only emphasized or only mentioned one of the angels, but never said there was only one angel there. And I believe all of these stories can be harmonized. And, and I hope that's what's happened in this, in this book that you're talking about. Right. That's what it is, but I haven't, I haven't yeah, read I've it or seen. anything. Um, but I, on the other hand, I'm thinking about when people respond to a fire, oh. let's say. Or a Bond to a what? A fire, a situation. Like a hot flaming fire, fire coals, fire? Firefighters. Fire, fire! Right. Okay. They all respond. It's one event, but they all see different things. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing that you have to consider, and that's why I do debriefing, so that everybody can see the entire picture when they all get together and say what they saw. Yeah. And then you put it all together. But if one person was just going to write, they were going to be leaving out things that this other person saw because they didn't mm -hmm. see it. Yeah, so they are supplementary to each other, not contradictory. Right. And, uh, and I think it would be a neat thing to, to read through a text like that, that that just puts it all together, gives you that big picture. Um, for some reason, God didn't put it together that way for us. And so I like to study them up separately, but I think it would be good to study them together too. God also didn't give it chapter and verse. Mm -hmm. Why do we feel that man can do that? Is that just simply for an indexing? Yeah, I think so. Just It's just helpful to find it, so to make sure that we're all on the same page, so that literally on the same page, so that yeah. you know, if I'm looking at something, I can, I can get you there right away. Because it unfortunately also encourages proof texting, mm -hmm. which is not a good thing. Which for... you could do even without the numbering, though, because you yeah, could say, oh, true. there's this sentence here or there. That's true. That's true. All but right. What's the biggest problem, sometimes it's the divisions are put in awkward places that probably aren't yeah. the best. All right, Pastor Paul Porter is in the house, Van Meter Baptist Church, 1030 on Sundays. We're discussing the supernatural nature of the Bible, and we're coming back. We thank you for listening to 99.3 The Truth. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. I'm Brian Leach, owner of Service Legends, and my position is Chief Talent Officer. I'm Nicholas Wondershide. I am Bernie Hobbs. And I'm the Service Manager. Marketing Director and Client Relations Manager. Everything that we do is about ensuring that we exceed your expectations. Our clients are important to us, 100% satisfaction. We're not just focused on heating and cooling. That's the easiest part of our job, actually, is fixing furnaces and air conditioners. Everyone that we come in touch with, we want to improve lives. Bottom line is, we've got our installation guarantees, 25% energy savings guarantee, comfort guarantee, temperature selection guarantee, property protection guarantee. 100% satisfaction guaranteed, fixed rate is free. All of those guarantees are backed up with a 100% money back guarantee. To hold ourselves accountable to making sure that you get what you're after. Just fixing the problem today, if they have another problem five days down the road, it's still a fixed rate or it's free. We use what's called straightforward pricing. Our technicians are gonna give you an exact to the penny price on what it's gonna take before they move forward with any repair. That way you know what to expect. It's the same price every day. No surprises. If you get off work at five o'clock in the afternoon, you come home, you realize that, oh, my furnace is broken. Now you need to call somebody out that night. You shouldn't have to pay more for that. We're guaranteeing service 24-7. We run afternoons, evenings, nights, weekends. We're staffed to work that. Phone rings at 3 in the morning. You'll get one of our representatives answering the phone every time. We're not sending you out to Timbuktu in some call center. It's our service legend team members, our mission control team. I'll take a call anytime. And then they answer the phones the same way during the day as they do at night. It's a great day at your service company. How can we make you smile? That's the only way to provide true 24-hour service. When you're able to let somebody actually live in their home safely when they weren't able to do that before, where they don't have to stay up at night and worry about, is the heat going to come back on? Are we going to freeze the pipes? Is the baby in the room next door going to be sick because they got too cold? When you're able to help somebody overcome challenges like that, that's impacting a life. That makes a difference. I get goosebumps thinking about it. I love the team. I love the people that I work with. <laughs> we have fun, but we work hard. I call them my ambassadors of legendary service. If you could just envision what that is, that's who we're sending to your home. They literally will call in, pick up the phone and call and say, hey, I want to talk to your manager. And I get on the phone, they're like, that technician that was at my house was the greatest technician ever. That's cool to me. We want to brighten people's days. Every person that we have going into the house has gone through an extensive background check. Drug testing, we have a very thorough interview process that one out of 140 people make it through. If we promise you something, that's what you're going to get, no matter what. We're here when you need us. 
to protect the safety and comfort of your family. If you're not happy, we're gonna make it right. If we're willing to put 100% money back guarantee on what we do, what type of work do you think we do? Give us a call, we're there for you 24-7, 365 days a year. Enough said. If you sit in the back view or the front view, it's your voice we want to hear. The phone lines are open, so call 244-0077. Now, here's J. Michael McCoy. Okay, uh, 238, 22 minutes before the top of the hour. Top of the hour is the Salem Radio Network News. Uh, updating us on all the news across the world. And then, of course, the Steve Dace, live here on KTIA. If you're a Webcast One live viewer, we appreciate you very much, more than we'll ever be able to tell you. But we'll tell you as often as we can. When we tell you, we mean it by saying this. Thanks for listening, or thanks for watching. Uh, I, I think it's important that we thank you for doing something that um, um, we probably take for granted or other broadcasters take for granted. If you have followed me throughout my career, thanks for listening has always been one of my favorite things to say. I think it's like when you're in the restaurant business, you tell people, hey, you know, I like it when you tell me my food's good, but make sure you tell me when it's not because I need to know that. Well, I think you need to know that I appreciate you taking the time to listen today. And as a listener, we have a brand new program starting at five today, David, six. Five. Five o'clock, David Burrier's new show will be right here on Webcast One Live, and you'll be able to get that on our YouTube page, as well as uh, he'll put it on his social media. So that'll be coming up today, and he'll have his entire family on uh, the show with him today. All right, uh, we've got Pastor Paul Porter in the house, Van Meter Baptist Church services at 1030 on Sunday. Uh, we're talking about the supernatural nature of the Bible and how... Uh, even more important than ever before, the Bible's truth, it's right and wrong, it's uh, God's word to tell us how we are to not only, you know, appreciate and adore the creation, but how we're supposed to honor and glorify the creator. And it's all in that wonderful book called the Bible. Um, basic instructions before leaving earth. Is that just something somebody came up with, or is, is that part of the Greek or Hebrew word that means Bible. Yeah, no, no. Did somebody came up with it? It's clever. I think it works. I think it works too. Mm -hmm. But Bible actually in Greek means the word. Or, or I think it's just book. Book, okay. Yeah. Is that right? Not sure of the Greek. I think it's just book. Biblos, I think it's just book. Yeah. I have a huge book uh, in my office at church that is the translation of every single word that's in the Bible, either to Greek or to Hebrew. Hmm. And uh, it is it gives me a headache to follow it. But oh my my, when we're in a Bible study and we want to know what this original word, what did it really say? What did it really mean? Mm -hmm. We're able to go in and, and decipher that. And uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful book when you want to get that deep. Yeah, th yeah, that stuff is, you know, I, we talk about having the original man manuscripts available to us. And some people may think, well, yeah, but I'm not a, I'm not a scholar. I'm, I'm not going to be able to find those things. But like, just like what you have, that is available yeah. to you. Uh, study tools that yeah. put it in our hands. That's a $45 book. I admit it, it's very, very hard. Well, it's not a book you read. Mm -mm. It's an index. It's, it's a source. Uh, and it, it's hard to understand. I mean, it, sometimes it takes all 12 of us in a men's Bible study. Of course, we're a bunch of guys at 6 in the morning. But it takes all of us to try to figure out that, what that word mm -hmm. meant. But uh, it, it can help decipher, you know, what is, again, the supernatural nature uh, of the Bible, the oh, truth. Okay, you just brought me back to my other question before at the first at the first. Okay, part. all right. But we have the first century church, the Acts church, that did not have... The, the writings of Paul or James, and they didn't have the New Testament. Um, and they had probably some aspects of the Old Testament, but those were in scrolls and those were in the synagogues. And yet the first century church, a lot of them met in homes. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't have their Bible. So how did they make it, Mac? <laughs> You're gonna have Mac, <laughs> um, you know they 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 had the the real deals right there with them. They had 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They had Peter. They had but not all, all of them. I mean, you know. They had them, and they had their uh, students, their disciples and followers that they taught directly. So um, I, I wouldn't say that they were in any way deficient. Um, they had they had the, the original teachers right there with them explaining these things. And when you get to a point in the Bible and you say, well, I'm not sure what this means— you know, they had the guys right there to talk to and say, can you explain this to me? So they had a really good deal going. Yeah, but they didn't write until no, years later. No, but they later. were still preaching the same messages. Mm-hmm. And so then, and then, it was, then it came time to start writing them down. Yeah. But, uh, but the same message was getting uh, preached and teached all over. And, and you know what, Mac? If Paul wasn't thrown in prison, uh, he never would have probably had a chance to write anything. <laughs> he did do a lot of writing in prison. That's right. And so... What just brings me to the point that when things happen, you know, sometimes we look at it as being bad. Mm-hmm. But in his case, prison wasn't bad for him. It was actually good for us. It was an opportunity. Just like with John on the island of Patmos. Exactly. Wrote the book of Revelation. Right. Right. Which, yeah. If there's any book that's tough to understand, there's there's one. Mm-hmm. Pastor Paul Porter is here from the uh, Van Meter Baptist Church. They meet at 1030 on Sundays, uh, and we're discussing some of the supernatural natures of the Bible. Um, One of the things that always confuses people, in fact, I had uh, Luke Tim in here yesterday. And Bob, you would have enjoyed being here. We started a series on denominations, just breaking down denominations. Oh, divisions? Yeah, there. (laughs) Thank you. I agree. Um, (laughs) And this whole idea of predestination. Mm Mm-hmm seems to just baffle everyone. Mm -hmm. And no one seems to be able to come up with the absolute um, argument over the contradictions. Mm -hmm. And it was mentioned to me yesterday that um, no one ever talks about the fact that what the Bible teaches, and I just want to get your, Mm -hmm. see if you agree on this or not, that the Bible teaches single predestination. It does not teach double predestination which would be the five-point hardcore Calvinist view on TULIP, that there is a limited atonement and that there is a, an elect, and those elect uh, will be wooed to Christ by their father, and there is some that will never get that opportunity. Mm-hmm where single predestination is exactly what this person was telling me. This is exactly what the Bible teaches. Yes, there are the elect. Yes, your name was written in the book of life. Yes, God foreknew you. Yes, you'll be justified, called, uh, called justified, uh, glorified, sanctified, etc. What the Bible doesn't talk about are the unelect. Mm. And we assume that if there are some that are the elect then certainly there must be some that aren't. Mm-hmm. What's, your, what, what, what's a Baptist thought on that? Or do you run from this kind of you know, malarkey? No, I, I don't run from, from this stuff. I, I enjoy talking about it and discussing it and debating it. Uh, you know, I don't consider myself to be a Calvinist. Um, but it's interesting. I've never heard those terms before, a single and double predestination. Um, so that one's kind of new to me. But, you know, I don't think that even that has to really divide us because I have lots of friends who are Calvinists, some who are Arminian, some who are somewhere in between. And, you know, I think people who are really honest with themselves and, 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 and really do more than just study that one issue, that our practices as believers, as Christians, as churches are all still the same. Whether you're a Calvinist or not, you're still out sharing the gospel with people. You're still out doing mission work. Yeah, it doesn't change. And, and, if, and, if, and even though I'm not a Calvinist, if I knew somebody that was you know, in an area where, you know, say, John Piper's church is, who's a big Calvinist, and they wanted to go there, I would say, go there. You're going to learn a lot about Jesus there. Yeah. Or if you, you can go to John MacArthur's church, who's Calvinist, I don't have any problem with that because they're still going to learn about Jesus. Pastor Paul Porter is our guest. Uh, I thank you for being here today uh, very much. Always look forward to having you come back and spend some time with us. Uh, When we come back, it's somebody's birthday. Somebody very special's birthday. I think her name is Mia. And she has a present to open. Uh, We'll do that when we come back. I'm J. Michael McCoy. If I haven't told you lately, thanks for listening. Love this job. Couldn't do it without you. Bob Monserrat, the cat in the hat on a 
special visit this afternoon. Don't usually get his company on a uh, Thursday afternoon. We thank you for being here. Dave Burrier in the studio. Uh, he's preparing for his uh, the debut of his brand new show, I Know Nothing. Is that what it's called? No. I've been there. That's right. Uh, that's coming up next. Mia's birthday next.